Good morning. This is the Reverend Laura Strauss of Sunset Hills United Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you are here worshiping with us this day. Beloved in Christ, we invite you to check your email for information about this week's services and events, and also in your email you'll be able to find the bulletin for today's worship service. You are able to print that out or to look at it on your phone or computer, but rest assured, if you are not able to access the bulletin, you will still be able to worship Jesus Christ with us this day just fine. Announcements for the benefit of the body of Christ this day. Today we are celebrating our graduates, the high school class of 2020. We are celebrating with something of a parade. We will be doing a drive-by today of all of our graduating high school seniors' homes. And so how we're going to do this, everyone is invited to drive up to the church a little bit before 1 o'clock. We're leaving at 1 o'clock, so arrive before 1 o'clock. Uh, we will have balloons. We invite you to bring signs. And we will proceed from the church at 1 o'clock to go and drive past the seniors' homes so that we can make a fuss and celebrate them. Other announcements this Tuesday, June 9th, begins our men's Bible study at 7 o'clock p.m. via Zoom. Friends, you can find that link online. You can also find it through the email sent by Karen Shine. The books for this Bible study can be found in the cooler located outside Finley Hall off of the parking lot. Also, Wednesday night begins a new Bible study led by Barb Clark. This study is called Before Amen by Max Lucado. You are, of course, invited to join us for that. And friends, information about that Bible study, also located on Zoom, can be found in your, your email from Karen Shine. If you have any questions about either of these studies or need that link to be able to get onto Zoom, feel free to email or call us at the church office. Our food pantry, the mini food pantry, is still up and running. Feel free to drop off any donations out back at the Finley Hall entrance. We are also dropping off donations at SHIM for the local food pantry. So please continue to give for the sake of our community in these difficult times. One final announcement, I will be away on continuing education this week and next. I am continuing my doctoral studies at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and so um, if there is a pastoral emergency, I can be reached, but otherwise the church office will be open and worship will take place next Sunday online. Everything will go forth as normal. I will just be away. Friends, let us be about a spirit of prayer this day. Let us pray. Holy Lord, this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit down now into our homes, into the spaces where we are worshiping, that we may bring you honor and glory. Open our hearts, open our minds to whatever it is that you would have us to hear and to learn this day for the sake of your kingdom. And all God's children said, Amen. I now turn our worship service over to our liturgist, our Christian Education Director, Barb Clark. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship found inside your bulletin this morning. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Come, let us worship the triune God, whose light shines in the faces of those who serve. The faces of those who know and love the Lord are radiant, but our sin keeps us from rejoicing in the radiance God reveals. Yet Jesus the Son carried our sins to the cross, and the Holy Spirit breathes new life into us so that we can praise God. Let us confess our sins that we may receive such grace. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession found in your bulletin this morning. Presence, radiance, fire, God who is three in one, we confess we have turned away from you. We gaze upon ourselves as if we are worthy of worship. We take your creation into our hands, not to love, but to use and then discard. We go to the people of the land, not to serve, but to press them into our service. We do not deserve that you would even notice us, but we pray for mercy because you are so merciful. 
flame of love, pur purify us from our sin. Eternal radiance, lead us to your truth. Risen one, baptize us into the union with you. Transform us into faithful disciples who worship you alone, God who is the Trinity. Please join me now in silent and personal confession. In Christ we pray, amen. The Holy One of Israel, the Redeemer of all the world, and the Holy Spirit, who comes as the breath of new life, forgets the sins of all of who repent. I declare to you, therefore, that you are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother, for us all. Alleluia! Amen! This morning, the Old Testament, or the reading this morning, is the Old Testament. We will start in Exodus chapter 34, verses 27 to 35. You can pause and grab your own Bible or join us in um, the bulletin, with the bulletin. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words. In accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with his two tables of the testimony in his hands, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And when Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what was commanded of them, the people of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses would put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Here ends the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we turn to Shelby Gracie for worship and song.
Friends, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and indeed every day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Many years ago, as the Black Lives Matter movement first got started, I was serving a congregation in rural Pennsylvania, a congregation that really didn't have a ton of experience with people of color because, I mean, <laughs> it was rural Pennsylvania. So as we discern together, okay, this is happening, the, the world is changing, there's obviously this issue, what do we do? We took a number of steps. One of them, we did a book study of the book Embrace by Leroy Barber that helped to open our eyes to understand a little bit more of racism in modern America. All well and good. We also decided to reach out to discern a call to reach out to a local African-American congregation that happened to be led by a young man who had guest preached for me quite a few times during his seminary days. He was a phenomenal preacher, a phenomenal pastor, and a phenomenal young man, and he continues to be all of these things. And so we reached out in partnership, the young pastor and I, he being a man of color serving an African-American church, he and I got together at Olive Garden to discuss, well, how can we form a partnership? What can we do? And we thought, wouldn't it be great if each of our congregations invited one another to various events at each other's churches so that we could build a relationship and so that we could learn from each other? Well, I went back to the church I was serving and said, you know, this is what we'd like to do. And we would very much like it if this, our church, the rural church, would create some sort of event to invite our sister church to. We talked, we brainstormed and thought, what do we do really well? We do bonfires. We do awesome bonfires with campfire sing-alongs and s'mores and hot dogs and apple cider. Yeah, it was fall. We would invite these friends of ours to a bonfire. So I called the African-American church. I called my colleague and said, hey, we've got it. We're holding a bonfire and you're all invited. Come and join us. And then the conversation got so silent. My colleague, my friend said, Laura, black folks don't really like going to bonfires held by white people. I was like, oh. And then I put two and two together and went, oh. I hadn't even thought. And then we, we decided, you know, I went back, I told my session, told my committee what was going on, and they came up with a new idea. We would have a Thanksgiving dinner with all kinds of really fun games and a hymn sing, and, and we invited the African-American church, and they came, and it was beautiful, and it was fun, and we had such a good time, and we were able to be so vulnerable with the, each other that one of the matriarchs of our sister church, of the African-American church, got up during the hymn sing and said, I just got to tell you all something. I don't know what you were thinking inviting us to a bonfire. Don't you know historically what happens to black people when white people bring them out to a fire? It's like, oh, my rural congregation, they howled, they laughed. They were both able to laugh at themselves and also able to hear, able to hear the story from our sister church of what it means to be an African-American person and what kind of history African-American people, what kind of anxieties, what kind of stories, what kind of, what kind of history they carry with them. It was beautiful. <sighs> and it makes me think of the history we carry as Presbyterians, traditionally Scottish Presbyterians. We carry a history where when we read today's scripture reading, we tend to want to be like Moses. In today's scripture, Moses is up on Mount Sinai, 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord. It is a powerful time where Moses is able to see God from behind. The impact of seeing God is so great. Now, first of all, scripture tells us that if, he had, if Moses had seen God from the front, 
kapum, Moses would have been dead. It would have been too much for his human, puny little brain to be able to handle. So Moses sees God from behind, and no, he doesn't go kerplomp dead, but Moses begins to glow. The literal Hebrew translation says that horns of light shoot out of Moses's face. Horns of light. Now, this got um, translated improperly by St. Jerome. And so for, oh... <laughs> <laughs> We're talking like 1,400 years. All artistic representations of Moses and all Bible said that Moses had horns. So if you look at, if you were to Google Michelangelo's statue of Moses, Michelangelo carved a statue of Moses with two little horns on his head. And if you read Bibles from before like 1880, 1890, you'll read, it says, and Moses saw the Lord and Moses had horns. I mean, isn't that silly and kind of fun? Adventures in biblical translation history. But today, with the um, transcripts that we have, with the older, older translations that predate St. Jerome, and with the older uh, manuscripts of Hebrew, we know that these were horns of light shooting out of Moses' face. So Moses is glowing, glowing Moses. And as Presbyterians, we kind of relate to that. Stick with me here. The Presbyterian Church 500 years ago, John Knox, this guy with a long white beard in Scotland, he runs away. He hears about this thing called the Reformation, that Roman Catholicism is kaput. It's done. And he gets on a boat and he chases after a man named John Calvin in Switzerland because he wants to learn more about this poo-poo on the Roman Catholic Church. And he goes to John Calvin and he learns all about this new tradition that is the Reformed Church. John Knox packs up all the lessons he gets from John Calvin, puts them in his suitcase, takes the boat back to Scotland, and begin, begins to preach to all of Scotland. Here's a new way of being. Reform. Do not be Catholic. You can read the Bible for yourself. You can read the Bible in your own language. You can pray to God directly. You do not need a priest. All the standard Reformation things. Queen Mary gets really ticked off because Queen Mary of Scotland, Mary of Scots, she's Catholic. And she gets really mad at John and John's new religion, Presbyterianism. So a bunch of folks who believe strongly, and I'm oversimplifying this, who believe strongly in what John Knox is saying, they say, we need freedom. We need to be able to practice this. They get on another boat and they go whoop all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, arrive in America and settle here in Western Pennsylvania. And they start something. They start something that 300 years later is still going on. They start the Presbyterian Church. These are people that are used to being in charge, used to being the ones making the decisions, deciding how this will go, forming the churches, deciding what is our church architecture going to look like? What is our worship going to look like? How are we going to interact with our community? How are we going to interact with the politics? They're the ones that are in the politics. The United States government is based on the Presbyterian system. How is that for power and influence and control? And so as Presbyterians, we are super accustomed to being the ones who are calling the shots, who are saying this is what's happening. We are the ones who think we need to glow, that we need to beam our light out so that everyone can see. And God, perhaps in this text this day, is saying, thank you. Great. Good job. Time to be Aaron. Time to be Aaron. It is time to say thanks for all that time that we were in control and to listen to how the Holy Spirit is actually working through and is actually present and is actually shining through others. To hear the stories the perspectives to be humble before the histories of others. As I think about what this looks like, looking for God's light in others, I think of that wondrous musical Les Miserables in which we learn to love another person is to see the face of God. 
When we love others, we can't help but seeing God glowing, shining through them, for God is indeed shining through them. I also think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I know, it comes back to him a lot, but it's, it's because he's good. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was this German theologian during the era of Nazi Germany, he got it not on a boat, I believe, but on a plane, and he came to the United States of America. He came because he felt that he had done much. He had written a lot of books. He had preached a lot of sermons. He had led a bunch of churches. And he thought, it is time for me to hear a perspective from brothers and sisters in Jesus who are completely unlike myself. He flew to America, to the United States, with the express purpose of studying the African-American church. He got into some really cool 1930s cars and drove all over the American South. He visited churches, and this, this stalwart German man learned how to clap, how to, to clap, how to raise his hands. He learned all about, all about the theology, the struggles that these people faced. I mean, this is 1930s America. Many of the people in these pews had survived slavery. Many of the peoples in these pews were currently enduring the realities of lynching, had lost loved ones to lynching. Because keep in mind, lynching wasn't properly illegal until the 1960s in many states. Um, lynching still took place until the 1960s. So that's what Bonhoeffer's walking into. And he learns from them and he sees this new way of, of being a Christian. And then it clicks because what's happening in Nazi Germany, as you all know, in the 1930s is really quite awful. And he thinks, wait a second, these lessons I'm learning from the African-American church are lessons that apply to what's happening to my country right now. And as the United States offers him um, the ability to stay, because this is the late 1930s at this point, and they know what's going to happen to Bonhoeffer if he goes home, um, various universities, various seminaries offered him teaching positions saying, look, we know it is dangerous for you to go home, but stay, stay with us and be safe. Bonhoeffer didn't take those opportunities. He learned from the African-American church what it means to stand with the oppressed, what it means to be oppressed, and what it means to stand with those experiencing oppression. He got on the plane. He went home. He advocated for the Jewish people of Germany. He advocated for the church in Germany and ultimately lost his life in a concentration camp. And so the point being, Bonhoeffer, as wonderful, as great, as well remembered as he is, he knew the importance of taking this position of Aaron, of saying it's not about what my light can do, it's not about shining my light, it's about going to see God's light in other brothers and sisters. It's hearing their stories. It's hearing their perspective. It's hearing their history and not making assumptions, like, you know, the assumption that they would love to have a bonfire. To get down in humility, on our knees, with open ears. God gave us one mouth and two ears for a reason. To hear the stories of those who have been oppressed, of those who have suffered, of those whose perspective is so different from our own in the body of Christ. My invitation to us this day is like Bonhoeffer, to take our own tour. Now, it is actually on my bucket list. As I mentioned in dev devotions this week, I am so interested in African-American history. It is on my bucket list to, to do a tour of the South from the perspective of um, African-American history. Oh my gosh, that would be wonderful. But that's not the kind of tour I'm talking about today. I think we are called, and I believe we are called by our God, to take a tour by hearing the stories of African-American experience. If we are going to fully understand why these people are so frustrated, to understand why these protests won't stop, 
to understand why people are so angry, to understand why there is such a pervasive sense of hopelessness, to understand why some people are making decisions that we would call unwise or harmful, it's important to hear the stories and to get out of our own perspective, to get out of our own history, to see where they are coming from, our brothers and sisters in the African-American Christian tradition. So there are um, a number of ways to do that. I will post some resources online on Facebook, and I will find other ways of getting resources to you of films, documentaries that are on Amazon Prime, on Netflix that are easy access and free, um, resources of books we can read that can help us to have this perspective, to hear these stories. And also, friends, I hope that we can continue having conversations. The Presbytery has posted a video of a conversation that they're having with um, African-American leaders in Pittsburgh Presbytery, and I will post that online so that we can be open to these stories, see the light shining in our brothers and sisters. All that said, I have a story to share with you. In James H. Cohn's book, God of the Oppressed, a book that challenged me, oh my gosh, did it challenge me when I first read it probably 15, 20 years ago, he talks about light. When we think of Moses, isn't it a wonderful thing that Moses lets his light shine? He covers it with a veil because if people see the light, oh my gosh, kerplop, they can't handle it. They will go, um, they will fall dead. But we're so excited that Moses is shining his light. And we often think, we are called to shine our light, which we are. But do you know where this calling to shine our light comes from? It comes from Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount to an oppressed people group, to the people of Israel who are under the occupation of Roman rule, to a people group who are often seeing their own lynchings in their own communities with crosses set up all around their country. We think of the crosses and an isolated event, that there was this one cross that happened one time with a thief on either side, and that that's how Jesus died, and, and it was one time. No, Jesus would have grown up seeing crosses all over his community, as would all the people of his community and his country. And so it is to people who are accustomed to seeing this kind of violence done to their own people, to accustomed to oppression, that he says, shine your light. He is saying that to us as well, but he is also saying it to the African-American church. And James H. Cohn writes of how the song, This Little Light of Mine, came to be. As you know, This Little Light of Mine says, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. God, give it to me, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. John Cassandra made a bold affirmation, you treat me like a mule, and because of God, I came out like a man. Every Sunday, James Cone writes, his grandmother would go to church because every Sunday when she was a slave, she would go to church, and after six days of hearing her master tell her that she was less than human, after six days of being humiliated and treated as nothing, she would go to church and be told, not only is she someone, not only is she beloved, not only is she human, but she is God's daughter. And so every Sunday, they would sing this song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. We sing it here now as children. We think of it as a children's song, but for them, it was a song of protest. It was a bold song to sing. You know what? I may be a slave, but I have a light. And you may be telling me that I'm not human, but I'm going to let it shine. It was bold. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And James Cone writes of how his grandmother sang that hymn every Sunday of her life as a protest, as a way of declaring who she was and who God made her to be. <laughs> that story opened my eyes because I've always thought of that song as something so 
bland and sweet and nice. And oh yeah, Sermon on the Mount. But boy, when we go digging deep, what light we find, what light is shining, shining forth from Moses and shining forth from our brothers and sisters in the African-American church today. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, as I go to grab the hymnal, I would invite you to prepare to declare what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. And we will be saying together the ecumenical, or rather the traditional, Apostles' Creed this day. If you would give me a moment here, here it is. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, beloved in Christ, Pittsburgh Presbytery has been offering us resources as we navigate this difficult time in our nation. One of those resources comes in the form of a conversation. Now, the longer conversation, which runs about a half hour, will be shared via the Facebook page and via our website in the days to come. But I would invite you now to enjoy this conversation from Pittsburgh Presbytery that is to help us along our journey of study and learning together. Greetings, my name is Brian Wallace. I serve on the staff of Pittsburgh Presbytery, one of the associate ministers, joined today by our Director of Justice Ministries, Ralph Lowe. Uh, and we're sitting here today because it has been a week for our country and for our city. Uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, we have had social unrest, we had the murder of a black man caught live and broadcast around the world. Uh, we have seen protests, we have seen rioting, we have seen speeches, we have seen so much has happened. And I know for me, I am tired, I am stressed, and I don't even know what to do. And I am a white man who lives in the suburbs in a very comfortable space. And uh, part of what I think is important is, even before we go on, what has this week been like for you as an African-American man, a father, a son? Go. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it's been, it's been tough. It's been very hard uh, as, a, as a father, Black father, um, a husband, um, it's been so hard. I, I can't even find the words sometimes to really articulate how difficult it's been. Uh, I run the gamut of emotions daily, sometimes hourly or by minute, uh, but it's been truly, it's been truly hard, Brian. It's been truly hard. I remember, so prior to this, I served a wonderful congregation in the North Hills and Anytime we had one of these incidents, I would just feel stuck and paralyzed, right? Because cause you want to say something, you know you need to say something, but you also don't want to be misheard. And race is such a volatile topic. And you see that volatility, right? I mean, this happened last week, and already we're seeing traditional political divisions emerging about rioting and race and the whole thing. And, and I know for me, as a pastor, this like stuck feeling is, is just, what do you do? And as I was thinking about that this week, like one of the things that really came to me is what has helped me so much in situations like this has been to reach out to my friends who are persons of color and say, to kind of in the midst of this, how you doing? But also what's really helped me understand better what's going on, because I just don't get it. Like I freely admit, I don't get it. I get it more than I used to, but I still don't get it. Um, tell me about your experiences where you've experienced, you know, racism, bias, whatever people want to call it. Um, but I think there's a very fair question. Like, how does it feel like for you? So for me, I would say if it was a friend like you who came to me and asked me that question, I would welcome it. I would tell you about my experiences uh, as, a, as a, a black man in this country um, of racism and oppression. 
But if you were a stranger who comes yeah. to me and asks me that question, I would kind of look at you sideways and, and think, why are you asking me this question? Because I want to be clear, Brian, it's, it's not the obligation of people of color to teach right. people who are not of color about racism. Um, it is, I think it's great uh, to, if you have the relationships, to ask those important questions, to get those experiences, but it's not the people of color's job to, to teach that. So when we were talking about this and brainstorming, mm -hmm. our yeah. first action point was, hey, if it, whoever you are, actually no matter what color you are at this yeah. point, mm -hmm. call a person of color mm -hmm. and say, hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. And then we realized for a lot of the people yeah. listening, they may not have someone to call. That's right, very true. And it may be because of where they live and yeah. where they've worked, yeah. right, for a number of things. But, but, but I think if we have one message for people, yeah. like part of what we've been entrusted with is a ministry of reconciliation. And if you're watching this, I would encourage you, if you have a friend who is a person of color, who there's trust, reach out to them mm -hmm. and say, what's this week, this week been like for you? Pray for them. I mean, yes, pray for all of us, but especially for our friends who are persons of color. Knowing that some people watching don't have somebody who they have that trust with. That's right. We've decided that in an accompanying piece that we're gonna post, you and I are gonna have one of those conversations. Yeah. Which are not always easy. They are not. Even easy. as, or yes. there is a lot of trust. Yes. It's not always easy. So, because people need, like, this is an understanding problem, and the only way that we move beyond the division is when we better understand. That's right. And when you begin to understand better, that's when that ministry of reconciliation, that's that right. disciples of Christ were called to, yes. it's not optional. Yes. Right? It's, it's not it, optional. It's not like Jesus forgives you and be reconciled to one another if you want. It's like we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's our hope. That is our hope. Um, that, that just in a little way by kind of modeling that and having one of those conversations and letting you all listen in, you can get a better sense of kind of how, how we can approach these things so that this constant division we're seeing can be lessened at least in one little way here in our city. Yes, and I, I just want to reiterate that I, I get it. I get you feel stuck as people who want to help but just don't know how. So I hope in our dialogue and our conversation, sure. this will help you to become unstuck and to move to act uh, in this world that we have, uh, this beautiful creation that we have from God, so we can make it a better place. So thanks. As we come before the Lord in prayer this day, we lift up in prayer, well, our nation. We lift up in prayer all of those who are feeling keenly the trauma of this past week. We lift up in prayer all of those who participated in the protests. We lift up in prayer all those who have experienced and expressed such vulnerability in sharing their stories and their backgrounds and their histories as African Americans living in this nation. We lift up in prayer those who have made unwise decisions, those who have done acts of violence this past week, those who have chosen to loot, those who have been hurtful and unconstructive toward the ultimate cause of equality. And we lift up in prayer the leadership of our community, the leadership of our county, our city, the leadership of the state of Pennsylvania and of our nation, praying that they would be faithful to God's calling and that they would make, indeed, wise decisions. We lift up in prayer our first responders, those men and women serving our nation both locally and abroad to keep this nation safe. And we pray for justice for all. And friends, we continue to pray for our nation and for the world as we continue to combat COVID-19, coronavirus, the pandemic, praying for wisdom and discernment, especially as we in Pennsylvania move into the green phase, we pray that we may do so in a way that is prudent and in a way that helps to continue to keep us on a healthy path. Now, friends, we come before the Lord in prayer using the prayer provided by the Book of Common Worship of the Presbyterian Church USA. Let us pray.
Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love. God, our creator, you made all things in your wisdom and in your love you save us. We pray for the whole creation, overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong, feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice, so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth you have made and joyfully sing your praises. Gracious God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to the world that all may believe you are love turn to your ways, and live in the light of your truth. Eternal God, you sent us a Savior, Christ Jesus, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth. Put down greed, pride, and anger, which turn nation against nation and race against race. Speed the day when wars will end and the whole world accepts your role. O God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbors, remove hate and prejudice from us and from all people, so that your children may be reconciled with those we fear, those we resent, those we threaten, and live together in your peace. Mighty God, sovereign over the nations, direct those who make administer and judge our laws, the President of the United States and others in authority among us, that guided by your wisdom, they may lead us in the way of righteousness. Eternal ruler, hope of all the earth, give vision to those who serve the United Nations and to those who govern all countries, that with goodwill and justice, they may take down barriers and draw together one new world in peace. Let us pray for the sick. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on those who are sick of body, mind, or spirit. Cheer them by your word and bring healing as a sign of your grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of comfort, stand with those who grieve, that they may be sure that neither life nor death, nor things present nor things to come shall separate them from your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of compassion, bless us and those we love, our friends and families, that drawing close to you we may draw close to each other, through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of all generations, we praise you for all your servants who, having been faithful to you on earth, now live with you in heaven. Keep us in fellowship with them until we meet with all your children in the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Mighty God, whose word we trust, whose spirit enables us to pray, accept our requests and further those which will bring about your purpose for the earth through Jesus Christ who rules over all things and all God's children said, Amen. Friends, if you have not done so already, I would invite you to prepare for the sacrament of communion. Now one way that we need to prepare for communion is by forgiving one another as we have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. So if there's anyone you need to forgive, you can press pause and, and you and Jesus can work on that right now. And if there's anyone that you need to call to be reconciled with, you can press pause and go ahead and be reconciled and do that work of reconciliation in preparation for coming to the Lord's table. You may also prepare using bread and wine or grape juice, whatever it is that you have in your home. Jesus used ordinary means for this extraordinary grace. 
And so feel free to pause and prepare your household for communion this day. I'll still be here waiting for you. Don't worry. Now, friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke's gospel, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. Beloved in Christ, our communion liturgy can be found printed in your bulletin. If you don't have your bulletin handy, just feel free to prayerfully follow along. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom, you made all things and you sustain them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. 
when we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then, in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Let us now pray for God's rule on earth, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again in glory. The gifts of God for the people of God. At home, I would invite you to take the bread. And if you are there together with others, serve the bread to one another, saying, the body of Christ given for you. And when you receive the bread, respond with, thanks be to God. And so I invite you at this time to distribute the bread. And if you are alone as I am, just hold on to your bread. And now if you have the cup, I would invite someone in your house to, to pour the grape juice or the wine. And friends, if you are wondering if this might be a, a good time to use the good wine you are saving for a special occasion, this is it. And so I would invite you to serve one another. You have your bread in hand. And as you pass the cup to a loved one in your home, you say, the blood of Christ shed for you. You respond with thanks be to God as you partake. If you are alone, as I am, just take your bread, take your cup, and dip. Friends, the body and the blood of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life. You have renewed us for your service. Help us who have shared Christ's body and received his cup to be his faithful disciples so that our living may be a part of the life of your kingdom. Our love be your love, reaching out into the life of the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen.